Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Uh, Yeah, man. Today's Tuesday, September 13th, 2022. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and UnX Networks. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Big show tonight, because we welcome very special guests. Timothy Hogan, Grand Master of the Knights Templar, another first-time guest. That's two this week. He is here to share some of the secrets. I'm going to try to get all of them of the Templar. Tomorrow night, Richard Doty, right here on this program. Going to be talking about the misinfo, disinfo that may be going on right now in ufology in our community. What is happening out there? Is that? He's the best person to talk to about this. That's tomorrow night. Thursday's another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. Coming up, I will be hosting and emceeing the Conscious Life Expo this February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton. Tickets and info. Dub, dub, dub. ConsciousLifeExpo.com. I was never able to say www really fast can't do it i'm not i'm not gonna try it right now you gotta practice that so i just say dub 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 conscious life expo.com april 7th through the 14th 2023 i will be hosting and presenting on the hidden secrets seminar at sea cruise with scott walter who just texted me right now and he said uh uh keep <laughs> <laughs> Keep Tim on his toes, Jimmy. There it is. Just came in a few seconds. Right as I said Scott's name, it my phone blinked. You probably saw me look down. And uh, it's Scott. Keep Tim on his toes. Scott's going to be there. Adam Apollo's going to be there. Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, and, and uh, half a dozen other great speakers. So uh, all you have to do is click on the links below, click on our social media, click over on our website, and get your tickets and go on a cruise with me, April 7th through the 14th. It's going to be awesome. I want you to get your free membership to the UnX Network at unxnetwork.com. It's totally free. Uh, who does that, right? Well, the X does. So head over. You will get their monthly newsletter. You're going to get access to the blogs. You're going to get event notices. They're doing live events all year long. So go and get your membership today. It's totally free. Unxnetwork.com. And, you you know, if if you click on the link and it's below or you head over to the Unx Network, it's right there. You don't have to navigate. It says, hey, free membership. Click here. Go and do it today. And you're also going to get a free digital copy of their quarterly magazine. And it's amazing. All right. So go and do it now. It's totally free right now. Eden pure has their thunderstorm three pack special. 
and I was saying this last night, um, uh, that we're heading into winter, fall and winter. And do you know what that means, right? Germs, viruses, things like that. You want to prevent everything that you can, and you do it with the thunderstorm right there. I've got mine. I've got mine throughout my house. I've got them in the car. And uh, the temperatures finally started dropping here in uh, the Mojave Desert. And it gets cold. I mean, it gets cold. It's the desert, right? So winter out here is just like winter where you are. Don't think. Now, it's hotter here in the summer than where you live. But in the winter, it's cold. And I need to protect myself as as well as having a clean smelling home and car. Thunderstorm three pack special. Save two hundred dollars on three right now. And you get free shipping. The link is below. Promo code fader three. If you forget the promo code, click on the link, head over there, scroll down to the bottom of the page. It'll have all those big name radio hosts down there at the bottom, all those big names, including mine. And I'm right there. I'm in some pretty powerful company. And uh, it's because the fader knots are so amazing. Just click on my name. Promo code goes in automatically. All right. All right. There you go. See, it's easy. Go and get your three pack of thunderstorms right now. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. That's what you want to do at J Church Radio. Jason Presson over in uh, the feed today posted this picture of this. Uh, it looks like I think um, that is one of the new uh, Fender. Uh, uh, I forget what they're calling that line, but it's got humbuckers. It's got a tram on it, and it's got that cool faded uh, finish on it. <laughs> he says, man, come this weekend, after three equal payments, this baby is mine. Yeah. That's fast times at Ridgemont High, but I had to use it. I had to use it. That's a good-looking guitar, Jason. Right on. The Sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. We don't bite. Come and hang out with us over there. If you've got the courage, go and join one of the chat rooms. But uh, uh, proceed at your own risk. I'm just I'm just telling you right now. Genocide, Bill, they got their hands full every single night. Thank you to all the moderators that, that keep that stuff uh, organized. All right. All right, let's get to the breaking news. Sad news today to report. Jazz great and pianist Ramsey Lewis died yesterday at his home in Chicago. He was 87 years old. Ramsey changed the world, man. He spent nearly 60 years recording and performing original jazz music, but had one uh, the biggest hit of the year, 1965, with that hit, The In Crowd. He won three Grammys, scored seven gold records, and in 2007 was named a National Endowment of the Arts Jazz Master, the highest honor bestowed upon jazz musicians in the United States. Today, I went and watched a bunch of live versions of uh, The In Crowd. Man, what a powerful song. Powerful, powerful. Ramsey Lewis. Whew, man, rest in peace. Amazing. Well, earlier today, Twitter shareholders voted in favor of Elon Musk's $44 billion takeover deal, valued at over $54.20 per share. But today, the company stock opened at just under $41 per share, nearly 25% below the deal price. The vote came days after Elon's third, third letter to Twitter seeking to terminate their deal with this one pegged to a purported $7.75 million severance payment that the company made to its former head of security, uh, Peter Zatko, who later blew the whistle about its alleged security and privacy vulnerabilities. Elon said, we had a deal, man, no severance packages that are blown up or inflated. I want out of this deal. I don't know if it's ever going to happen at this point. Well, after that, this news came out about Tesla because a security consultant firm has identified a sophisticated relay attack that lets just two thieves unlock a Tesla Model Y 
start the engine in just a matter of seconds. Now, this is how they do it. You have one individual, one thief, one criminal to be near the Tesla owner with their smartphone to capture data from their key card. I'm not making this up. While the other waits by the target Tesla, right? With a device designed to pick up the data from their accomplice who's inside the the coffee shop with the Tesla owner. You know what I'm saying? This attack, according to the consulting firm IO Active, is a flaw in a software update Tesla released in 2021 that eliminates the need for the owners to place that key card on the center console to change the vehicle's gears. After the thief drives off with the stolen Tesla, they cannot turn off the engine. Nope, because they won't be able to restart it. But while the engine's running, they're good, and then they don't have the original key card, but you can add a new key card at some point while the engine is running. And that is nuts. Well, Mark David Chapman, the doofus who fatally shot John Lennon back in 1980, has been denied parole for a 12th time. Chapman, who was serving 20 years to life uh, at Greenhaven Correctional Facility in New York, appeared before the parole board on August 31st. Chapman has sought parole every two years since the year 2000 when he was first eligible, and he'll remain in prison for at least two more years, and then he'll be eligible to seek parole again. The department has not yet released the transcript from Chapman's most recent parole hearing. The death of another Russian energy executive over the weekend adds to a long list of mysterious deaths of high-powered national businessmen since the February 24th invasion of Ukraine. His name, Ivan Pokorin, 39 years old, managing director of the Corporation for the Development of the Far East and the Arctic, allegedly fell off a boat. That's right. He died Saturday near Rusky Island in the Sea of Japan and Russia, Um, about 5,800 miles east of Moscow. That's right. Fell off a boat. Let's get this show cracking. On this day in history, OTD, you remember this, 2004. Oprah gives away 296 new cars. A brand new Pontiac G6 sedan worth $28,500. Gave one away to everyone in her studio audience. You remember, everyone gets a car. Everybody gets a car. You remember that? (laughs) Well, the car was free, but the IRS collected six grand for each one. There you go. Fader fact. Here you go. Now, I wonder, I wonder if Timothy Hogan knows this. Check this out, because he knows a lot. Ketchup. That's right. Ketchup wasn't poured on hamburgers until the 20th century. Prior to that, it was sold as a cure for indigestion, diarrhea, and jaundice. And that is your fader fact. There's another rumor. The Templars brought ketchup over from Jerusalem. Yeah, snuck it into the United States. I'm glad they did it. That's the only condiment I, I, on on my burgers. Ketchup. Eh, mustard sometimes. Sometimes mayo. Depends on my mood. But I can't do a burger without ketchup. And I have no indigestion, no diarrhea, and no jaundice. All right. Tonight, very special guest, Timothy Hogan, is here. He is the worldwide grandmaster of the Knights Templar. He's another first-time guest. And tonight, he's going to share some of those secrets. I'll see what I can get out of him. And, uh, uh, (laughs) you know, with Tim, here's the thing. I don't think we're going to hear from Tim. Ah, I've got an NDA. Can't talk about that. I don't think that's what's going to happen. So let's see what we can do. Tomorrow night, Richard Doty is back. And uh, it's a lot of misinfo, disinfo, I think, is going around right now in uh, ufology and the UFO community. And 
And I reached out to Richard. I said, hey, we got to talk about this. He said, absolutely, Jimmy. Something smelly in Denmark. So we're going to do that tomorrow night. Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. Now it's time for me to hit this River Moon coffee. The only coffee with my picture on it. Rivermoonwellness.com. Head right over there. Fade to black blend. The game changer blend. You can go to the Amazon store. You can go to the website. You go to Amazon, free shipping if you're a Prime member. That's a great deal. Head over to the website. Use the promo code F2B blend. You'll get 15% off of your order today. They have been with us on this program for a very long time. And Juanita and Jeff are fader knots to the core. And uh, I, I just can't say enough. I'm so thankful for their sponsorship and their friendship. Fade to Black Blend. It's the best coffee in the world. Seriously. You should go to their website and check out how they make the coffee, where they get the coffee, how they source it. Um, and and it's it's just done with morals and ethics, as it should be. <sighs> Fade to Black Blend. I like my coffee, Doc. All right. The Knights Templar. The Knights Templar. I've been hearing about them since I was a kid. Here's the deal. When you go through, at at the age when I started to hear about the Knights Templar, and, and you would look at what they wore, right? The shields, the cross. And there was a certain amount of, uh, uh, how do I say this? There was mystery. There was mystique. But there was a big dose of, I want to do that. I want to be that guy. And you hear about uh, their, their, their rules and, and what it took and who they were. That added to all of it, right? And so then you start to read, and and I'm talking about a very young age, and you 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 find out about the Crusades, you um, you read about how uh, the support to get these pilgrimage uh, pilgrimages. To, to Jerusalem and, and safe passage and, and how uh, brutal, you know, that journey was. That just wasn't easy. You're not just ticketing, you know, passage on, on, a, on some yacht or some boat and, and heading over. No, it was, it was something that you risked your life for. And that's, that's what the Knights Templar, so you read that part of it. And then you, you swing it over and you start to get a little bit deeper into it. And and you find out about the the strength and the defending of uh, the pilgrims in Jerusalem. There was uh, quite a few uh, different different countries in the world that that didn't dig what was going on there. Um, and so you, you hear about that part, and then you hear you just do the deep dive, the banking system. Right now, wait a minute. What? What did they do? Right? They developed a banking system. Th- these guys are knights, right? Defenders of the faith. Banking systems. And then you then you hear the stories about uh, the pursuit of religious artifacts, and you hear about this, and and what they found and how they found it. You know, uh, buried deep underneath uh, Jerusalem, under tunnels, uh, in tunnels, under temples. You hear about that part. And then it's Friday the 13th. And you hear about not only that, but w- immediately before that, the the power 
that was incidental, it comes along with it, that the Knights Templar grew. They started uh, buying land. Um, they had the banking institution there. And they started to, and, and, and quite possibly, possess some secrets. There's alchemy that was involved, too, as well, which was a pursuit of every king and queen and, and lord in Europe uh, to, uh, to get to these secrets of alchemy. Um, there was religious artifacts. And then came what is going to do, uh, what is going to happen with that, the incidental. It's called power. Can't have that. And so Friday the 13th comes along, and we hear about that. All of this, when you look at uh, the and what happened, you know, what happened, it couldn't have been a couple of dozen guys. That's, that's not the case. So what happened to the wealth? What happened to the artifacts? What happened to the secrets? Um, where did they go? And where are they today? You have all of that. And then there's this for me. And I, and, and I don't say this in a, in a clandestine way or in a, in a, a cavalier way, clandestine, maybe it's that too as well, in a cavalier way. Then you have something like how the Knights Templar were starting to uh, be portrayed in history books, in the media, in movies, and the Holy Grail. And then you have Monty Python. The imaging that was there, and it, now I understand this is this is history, but did Parsifal have it right? Okay, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail, um, and the imaging that was there. I sat back and went, "Wait a minute." Is this the Knights Templar, which also uh, the story about the Grail, funniest movie ever in the history of everything. And I get that as well. But a lot of people saw that movie and the idea of the Grail and Percival and uh, the the story of King Arthur. And was this a combination of the Knights Templar and how to tell the story? Well, it went worldwide. And that elevated the level of the Knights Templar. It's all about marketing, right? And it caused people to go back and look at this and study it. And I did the same thing. And I thought, that's that's what I grew up with. That's the Knights Templar. That's That's what's going on here. And then I went and I dived into every story uh, about King Arthur. I dove into everything I could about the Knights Templar. Um, Hollywood ended up releasing some pretty big budget movies uh, about the Knights and and the rise and fall in and around Jerusalem and, of course, back over in Europe and uh, Friday the 13th. And then there's this. Tim Hogan is on with us tonight. And one of the things that all of you know, Scott Walter has been on this show 10, 20, 30, 40 times. I don't know. And... And my interest into the Knights Templar, um, I, 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 it, it can't be measured. And then diving into Scott's brain and, and trying to figure out what is going on and who was in America before the history books. Columbus, of course, but, but, but other versions of that. And then Scott starts telling me about Tim Hogan. And and then uh, at about the same time, people that I trust, people that I know, people that I call friends um, started to mention Tim's name. And Jimmy, you've got an interest in this. This you, you need to talk to Tim. So um, a few months ago, I, uh, I said, Scott, Tim Hogan. That's right. I said, OK, thumbs up. Right. Yes. Here's the deal. This past weekend, um, I was able to sit down with Tim and and pick his brain, not only uh, uh, for the TV show that I can't really talk about right now, but but there was that part. 
Um, but there were conversations that we had leading up to that. And then, of course, dinner that went into the wee hours of the morning. And his knowledge on so many subjects um, is extreme. And I asked him if he could go ahead and come on the show tonight and let's discuss these things. And he said, absolutely. No limits. I said, okay, let's go. So that is my interest into the Knights Templar. I have spent a life, I'm 58 years old, looking into this, building up questions, wondering what is going on. I've done so many shows on this in the past, and and tonight is uh, one of many that we're going to do with Tim. But stay put, get ready tonight. Timothy Hogan, Grandmaster Worldwide of the Knights Templar, is here. He's a first-time guest, and tonight it is The Secrets of the Templar. Tomorrow night, Richard Doty is with us. Misinfo, disinfo, in ufology, and our community. What is going on? Richard will be with us tomorrow night to talk about that. And then, of course, Thursday night is another fader night with open lines all night long. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Buckle up, kids. It's going to be one of those nights. It's Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fate to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fate to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. 
Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the unxnetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Timothy Hogan, Grand Master of the Knights Templar Worldwide, joins us to, for the first time, talk about the secrets of the Templar. He is the Worldwide Grand Master for the Knights Templar, OTSI, and he runs the Templar Collegia in conjunction with it. He has been knighted in France uh, to the order of the uh, Parcelet and the Dove. And knighted in Scotland into the Order of the St. Andrews and into the Royal Order of Scotland. He has also been knighted as a Gold Star Sir Knight of the Knights of the Glen. He has been a student and a past master within several different esoteric organizations over the last 25 years. He has studied and served as a leader within various branches of Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, uh, Martinism, and Templarism, as well as the orders of both Eastern and Western lineage. He has written eight books and dozens of articles for different periodicals. He is known for speaking worldwide at both public and private venues, delivering hundreds of lectures. Timothy serves as an expert in cross-cultural symbolism, and he is regularly works as a consultant in the entertainment industry and helping in track to diplomacy worldwide. Uh, all of his books are in the links below, and I would welcome, like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Timothy Hogan. Timothy, sir, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me on. This is a big deal to me, man. This is a big deal. Well, it's a big deal to me, too. Well, here's the, you know, I uh, I know you were probably uh, listening earlier, and I, like uh, so many, uh, you know, kids, right? Kids, knights, right? And, and things, we grow up and uh, following this, we all, we man, we all wanted to be hanging out in Camelot, you know? And uh, so there's that part of it. But uh, meeting you, um, is, is, it, it was meant to happen. And so thank you. But before we get started, you get the first time guest disclaimer. All right. Which is this, Timothy, it's just you and I sitting on my couch, having a conversation as friends and where that conversation starts, it starts where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. There Sounds you go. Sounds great to me. Well, we're already friends, but yeah. you know, it, it, the first time guest disclaimer is a big deal. So there you go. Um, I kind of want to start here. Um, when, when I say something as lofty as the worldwide grandmaster of the Knights Templar, right? Yeah. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. Yeah, it feels heavy. Well, what, <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Well, there there are uh, there are a number of different Templar lineages around the world, and uh, they they come together in a kind of like a United Nations, if you will, of of Templar bodies known as the Order of the Temple of Secret Initiates, and I'm head of that. So, um, and. 
basically what that means is uh, it's my job just to make sure that the the mission of the templar work is stays on track and uh that we're we're staying true to our principles uh and and then we also have to make sure that there's certain things that we're trying to protect are staying protected and and that they are revealed to the world uh in appropriate manner um okay i, I can i do a disclaimer really quick yeah. i'm going to do a disclaimer um uh, timothy's got a pin point to the pin on your lapel okay oh, that one there. yeah yeah so so i go up to timothy and i go dude i want that pin and he gave it to me. So, but, but it's, it's, it's in symbol only. I'm not a Knights Templar yet, but, but, uh, but I got the pin, right? And it was so special to me. Um, and when you see somebody wearing that pin, what does it tell you? Do you guys wink at each other from across the room? You know, like, yeah, I mean, kind of, we have other ways of recognizing each other, even without the pins. But um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a way of, of recognizing, hey, you know, you're a brother, or you're a sister within the order, and, uh, you know, you're doing the work. Yeah, yeah, right on, right on. Okay, so the next probably uh, most important question is, uh, Grandmaster, right, of the world, that means you get you get the secrets, Right? Are you are you exposed to those things that we have been hearing about in in our circles over these years? Are you the guy? Yeah, I mean, I'm. I have to stay on top of all that. I mean, there there are there are lots of secrets, you know, from anything from, uh, you know, actual artifacts that have been secured over the centuries to, you know, certain philosophical ideas. Um, uh understanding of certain sacred texts and uh what some of that means as, as well as how to apply certain technologies that that we've uh we've we've come to understand related to the to the things we've uh acquired over the you know over the last thousand years do, do you guys have uh and gals mm -hmm. Do you guys have a central depository, repository, uh, a central place, or are these things, and we're going to talk about this as as the night unfolds here, of course, but, um, or is it spread out around the world? It's somewhat spread out around the world. I mean, there are multiple vaults that contain uh, some of the artifacts, and uh, they are in... I mean, some of them are here in the Americas, and and some of them are actually overseas still, and uh, but they're all in places that are safe, uh, so that they can't be um, stolen and misused, and uh, you know, so so that any one uh, religion or governmental structure can't take them and try to, you know prop themselves up as the only power or authority uh, over other people with them. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. Let's, let's back up for a second okay. and let's talk about the origins of the Templars um, mm -hmm. and how that actually started. Um, we're not going to do an extensive history lesson here, um, but one of the things that is difficult to do um, is is find research and 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 true knowledge of not only the Knights Templar. Um, many books have been written, and I have most of them, and have read them. Um, but it's the other things around the Knights Templar too, as well. You can't find actual knowledge on alchemy. You're not going to find that online. You you need to go to the source uh, for for that information. Um, also, uh, different objects, uh, different uh, text, uh, different relics. You're not going to find that stuff online. Um, and so I want to talk about that stuff um, that is difficult to do, and you're the source to go to that. And the other thing that is uh, has been clouded in history 
is the actual origins of the Knights Templar. So let's start there. What were the origins? Well, so the origins are really, uh, so going back as far as 10, well, it's actually as far back as 1057, uh, there was a group of, you know, philosophers in Greece that came together that were trying to, uh, they they knew that they were preserving certain information, and they they moved themselves to Constantinople at the time. And uh, by 1096, there was uh, there was um, some of the early members of the order, including Hugh de Paynes and Godfrey de Saint Omar. Uh, Hugh de Paynes became the first Grand Master of the Templar Order. He they had both traveled to Constantinople. Uh, and had been uh, initiated or received by this uh, this tradition. Uh, and they were given a mission specifically to go find these artifacts. Now they had uh, Hugh de Paynes and Godfrey de Saint Omar, they had they themselves had come from certain families that had been preserving a history. And ultimately, the goal of all this was it was believed, and it was understood that there had been a advanced civilization in antiquity and that something had happened and it had wiped out, become wiped out, and that there were pockets of it that had survived in different regions. And so the order was found specifically to go out and find these these pockets or the remnants of these pockets of survival and to, to uh, talk with them about what they were sitting on um, and uh, really to, to try to bring all this knowledge together and bring it back to Europe to uh, what, and this is what ultimately led to the Renaissance, um, you know, because the Europe had been in the dark ages at this point. So they they um, ended up going into Jerusalem, which was one of the places that they were. They knew there were certain artifacts. Uh, they started digging. Uh, they were officially founded, according to uh, the Roman Catholic uh, tradition. They they were officially established in eleven eighteen. But really, this was just when the Roman Church started getting involved with them. Uh, they had already been doing stuff prior to eleven eighteen, um, but they uh, they started getting some um, patronage from certain members of the Roman Church, and they began digging. And once they started digging, they found all kinds of artifacts, some of which related to this previous civilization and some of which related to uh, biblical history including uh, people who were involved in uh, both you know Old Testament or Torah and New Testament stories uh, and they discovered this whole other you know alternative, uh, understanding to the Bible than what had been being taught in Europe at the time. Uh, and they tried to bring some of this stuff back to Europe, recognizing that some of it would be accepted, some of it really people weren't ready for yet, and uh, some of it they specifically made sure not to turn over to the Roman church because they knew it would just disappear if they did that. Uh, so they ended up turning it over to other communities who they knew would be, be able to be responsible. Uh, with well, there was at the time, uh, there was a race uh, to get to these relics that had been rumored uh, uh, for, at that point, over a thousand years, right? And yep. so um, the Spear of Destiny, right? The True Cross, the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, um, uh, everybody wanted uh, these items, and it wasn't just the Roman Catholic Church uh, that was going after this. Uh, there were m m many groups in pursuit of these, right? 
that's correct. Yeah, there were, there were Jewish and, and Muslim uh, traditions as well that were, were trying to secure these things. And then there were other groups uh, that were uh, more Unitarian, Gnostic in nature, like the Druze and the Sabaeans that were preserving their own aspect of, of things. And, and uh, so the Templars just tried to navigate all of this and uh, take what they could and bring it back into Europe. They, they also got involved in uh, building construction and farming along with banking uh, and began to build. They were really responsible for building the first cathedrals in Europe and tried to incorporate some of this knowledge onto the cathedrals. Uh, most people think of the cathedrals as just uh, giant churches with depictions of the Bible on them, and, and they do have that. But there was all kinds of other uh, arts and sciences that were also included on those cathedrals that they, would, that they were bringing back from the knowledge that they were gaining in their travels. You know, not only into Jerusalem, but also into Egypt uh, and other places, uh, some we have even argued that they were traveling as far as India and and Ethiopia and um, and they began doing secret trips to the New World of the Americas. And 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 we'll get to that. Um, I I, I want to talk about um, some of the things that they were finding. And if they actually understood what, you know, what kind of knowledge that they were in possession of, because uh, when we go back to the Library of Alexandria and the foundations of philosophy and alchemy that were established from, you know, uh, the, the, the brains that were collected from around the world that gathered there and shared their knowledge, this made its way um, into uh, Jerusalem and, and the Middle East, and certainly uh, into Greece and and later Rome. Um, but this information uh, about alchemy is something that you wouldn't necessarily understand its importance. Did they know what it was and how important it was as they collected it? Yeah, well, they they understood, you know, first and foremost, they were approaching the subject from a, uh, you know, a biblical perspective. I mean, they started looking at the biblical text, uh, you know, and, and talking about, you know, the Bible talks about all these weird things like uh, Moses burning a golden calf into a powder that the, that the Hebrews would eat. Well, this was... You know, this was something that, uh, you know, any modern scientist would say, oh, this is just proof that the Bible's full of hooey because everyone knows that the gold melts. It doesn't turn into a powder. But but actually, there is an alchemical process where you can turn gold into a powder. And uh, they were, these were things that they were seeing on the temple walls of, of ancient Egypt. Uh, and... Uh, and then they were meeting groups like, again, like the Tohid Mohadun Druze uh, that were practicing alchemy and, and also uh, the Sufi and, and uh, other, other there were certain Gnostic sects, uh, you know, including the, the Manichaeans and the Bogomils and the Mandeans and the uh, Albigensian who were passing on their own alchemical understanding. And... So when they went down to uh, places like uh, in the Middle East, like Jerusalem and then into Egypt, and they started finding certain artifacts that seemed to have an alchemical component to them, mm -hmm. they, of course, they brought them back to these other groups that they were associating with, and they started figuring out how to do it. Is that a statue of is that is that Akhenaten? It yeah. is Akhenaten behind me here. He's 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 got my back. Yeah, right on. <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay, so um, what uh, 
the focus of the Roman Catholic Church at that time, there's the religious stuff, you know, the direct religious uh, things, but these other traditions that may have been heretical, right? Were they interested in, in, in getting that and suppressing that knowledge and keeping it away? Well, they, at first, they were okay with the idea of the Templars bringing uh, certain money, wealth, back to Europe, uh, building these these cathedrals. You know, the Roman Church thought, "Oh, this is this is in our interest." You know, I mean, they're, they're building all these these things and they're bringing wealth back in, and and as long as we get ours, then we'll just let them be. Uh, but after a while. Uh, they started recognizing that uh, the Templars weren't weren't giving everything up to the church. In fact, they were setting up entire systems independent of the church and independent of the monarchy. So they were they were setting up new systems of power um, independent of the two dominant systems at the time. And uh, not only that, but then they were taking. Uh, a lot of this uh, knowledge, uh, including uh, Gnostic uh, texts and uh, apocryphal texts and things that just weren't even in the standard canon of the Bible, uh, and, and it's including their associations with uh, Muslims. And, and it started to, you know, they started to develop a, a system that uh, was not completely uh, in line with the Roman Catholic uh, dogma of the time, shall we say. And, and eventually, you know, it resulted in the Roman church actually going and suppressing them by 1307. Okay. So now let's talk about the end of, you know, uh, Friday the 13th. Yeah. Um, I, I have one basic uh, question that may seem uh, um, uh, kind of dumb, uh, uneducated, but it seemed like uh, not there wasn't that many deaths, right? And now we yeah. see the tombs and, and, and we see that, but I only see the representation of, you know, a few dozen, you know, and, and I don't see... Uh, where history wants to say that uh, the Templar grew so powerful in Europe and, and the land that they possessed and the money that they possessed, and that, that had to have been supported by uh, a lot of Templars. And we don't, it, history doesn't show us that. It seems that Friday the 13th was there and there was an attempt to close it down, but the Knights Templar disappeared. What yeah. part of history is correct here? Yeah, so basically what happened is uh, the the arrest orders for the Templars actually took uh, was issued um, in early September of 1307. So th these arrest orders were sent out to the different provinces that basically said, hey, on October 13th, we're going to round up the Templars. Um, so what the Templars did is, of course, they found out about this. I mean, it was supposed to be secretive, but they found out about it. So what they did is they they left, um, you know, about 100 Templars behind in France to pretend like, you know, everything was going as business as usual. And then they got all the other Templars out of there with the treasures and their ships and everything else. So that, uh, and the, the hope was, in, 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 including Jacques de Molay, who was the Grand Master of the Templars at the time, he stayed behind, hoping that uh, when the arrest orders came, that yes, there would be, you know, uh, about a hundred of them arrested in Paris, but it was his hope that he could negotiate out of it. And that, and that reason would prevail, and that ultimately they would be let go. Uh, but of course, that didn't happen. Um, the, uh, the Roman church wanted the Templars to, to merge with the Knights Hospitalier, 
which was another competing uh, order, and uh, which later became known as the Knights of Malta, and the Templars wouldn't do it. Uh, Jack de Molay refused to do it. Uh, Philip the Fair, the, the king, the French king, wanted the Templars to turn over all their their wealth to him so that he could use them to fund a war, a new war that he wanted. And uh, they wouldn't do it. <laughs> and so as a result of all this, you know, with the, with the, with the treasures missing at that point, with all the holy artifacts having disappeared, as well as all the ships, uh, you know, the, the, the Roman church and uh, the French king were left in a real bind because everything that they were going after, it was very clear they weren't going to get. So they tried to extract it via torture for seven years. And, uh, you know, a number of Templars died via torture. And then ultimately by 1314, uh, they ended up burning Jack de Molay at the stake, uh, as well as with other Templars like Geoffrey de Charnay, who was the grand preceptor from Normandy. And uh, they, you know, and, and uh, but Jack de Molay issued a, a curse right before he died, uh, saying that uh, Philip the Fair and Pope Clement V would, uh, would join him <laughs> within a year. And sure enough, they both died within a year after uh, Jack de Molay was burnt at the stake. So, so um, we, we need to take a break right here. And when we come back, I, I, I think it's important that I left everything out. You know, we got the beginning. We got the end. Okay, now what happened next and and where did everything go and where are we today? We've got a lot to talk about tonight. Everybody just stay right there. This is Fade to Black. I am Meryl Jimmy Church tonight, the world grandmaster of the Knights Templar. Timothy Hogan is with us. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Fade to Black on KJCR, the Game Changer, and NX Networks. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNXDB, VX. Hello, Fade or Nots, Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Find the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3-pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. 
Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fade or not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church tonight. Timothy Hogan is with us, worldwide grandmaster of the Knights Templar. And uh, now I've set the stage, uh, the beginning and, and the end, uh, the technical end. Uh, I, I guess I could say the um, uh, what's the, the dogma end, right, <laughs> of of, uh, of what we've been told over the years of the Knights Templar. Um, now, uh, for everybody uh, that is listening tonight, there's a few things that uh, need to be discussed because you know we just want to know. We've all seen Indiana Jones, right? Okay, so let's kind of start there. Uh, there's a few main things that are talked about that have been missing. And I want to start with the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, did the Templars uh, spirit, <laughs> I, I just said spirit, did they spirit that out of Jerusalem? Yeah, so uh, uh, there were actually multiple Arks that were, uh, according to our tradition, uh, I mean, th there were multiple Arks that were taken out of that region. Uh, and I say multiple arcs. I mean, most people think of one Ark of the Covenant. Uh, our, our records show there were actually 10 different uh, different of these arcs, and we secured six of them, uh, which we then uh, smuggled uh, basically from uh, Egypt and Jerusalem up into uh Portugal and then well up into Lebanon and then from Lebanon to Portugal, Portugal uh, up into uh, France and Scotland, and then eventually to the New World of the Americas. Well, you you said ten. There were ten. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 the nice Templar. Uh, uh, six. Yeah. yeah we six six of them. But was one the Ark of the Covenant, and the and there's nine others, or were they all the same? I think they're all all the well, they're all pretty much the same. They they are uh, 
the thing you have to understand about these arcs is that they're basically uh, big capacitors. They, they, they are made out of alternating layers of acacia wood and gold, and uh, they weigh, you know, a couple tons, and uh, they are built in such a way that uh, they, especially if they're put in a somewhat of a static environment, if, if you remember... Uh, the arcs were the ark. Even if you look at the the uh, the Torah or the Old Testament, it, it, it talks about how uh, originally, prior to Solomon's temple being built, there was a tabernacle erected in the wilderness, and it was erected with these uh, wool wool uh, basically sheets. And uh, these wool sheets would just build up static electricity, and the, the well, they would they would collect static electricity, and then the arc would would build it up, and uh, it would discharge through the through the the winged fingers figures on the tops of it. And this is really the reason why, even in the Torah, it talks about how you couldn't touch the ark without dying because you'd be shocked to death. I mean, it would literally shock you to death. Even if you were a good person, if you touched the ark, it would kill you. And so uh, the, the way around this was they they would take a, a, a rod, like in the Bible they refer to like Aaron's rod, and they would take this rod and stick it on the ground and then let go of it and it would uh, fall into the ark and it would ground the electricity and then they could take the lid off the ark. It would discharge. Discharge it, yep. Okay, so six. The number shall be six. Yeah. Okay. Um, is the Knights Templar still in possession of the six arcs today? Yes, we know. Well, we know where they are. They're in a series of vaults. And uh, we are responsible for guarding them. And we work with other groups who are also responsible for guarding them until yeah. the world's ready for them, basically. Uh, do, uh, have you seen them? I have. Not all of them, I, but I have seen some of them. And what can you tell me? Uh, what did you see? You're still alive, right? <laughs> so, but um, uh, what did you see? How can you describe them uh, to me? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, they're they're gold boxes. I mean, the actually the depiction of it in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark isn't too bad, uh, to be honest. Uh, but uh, these these boxes are actually depicted on the, the ancient Egyptian temple walls. You can find them all over the place at at uh, places like Dendera and Philae and. Uh, uh, other places where the Templars had set up um, commanders and, and preceptories in in Egypt. Well, I've, uh, seen, I've, I've seen some of these images. Abydos, Edfu. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen some of these images, and clearly that that's what is represented there. Yeah. Um, and also, in in some of these images, it appears that there are cables connecting uh to i've, I've uh, seen one image with four right yeah. and there's four cables going to uh one single cable four cables going to each of the four boxes um and i think that that is what that represents it seems to look like electricity to me it doesn't yeah uh, you know maybe it's my modern mind uh looking at it that way but it doesn't look like something that would just be naturally represented somewhere in Egypt. It looks like there's four boxes uh, with four cables. Well, there's no it's no coincidence that the that the one of the words for uh, an electrical spark is known as an arc. I mean, <laughs> because it's directly tied to these arcs. Well played, um, there, Timothy. Well played. I didn't make that connection, but you're right. You yeah. want to arc something out, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, why 10? Well, why 10? I, were they used in different locations to power things up? I think that that's my understanding. They they were the, the 
what we understand or what we believe we understand now is that this was a technology that had been developed uh, probably in Atlantis. Maybe it was given to the Atlanteans by other entities from off this earth. I don't know. Okay, okay. let me stop you right there. The Bible says God. Yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the thing is you can build one of these, and uh, they're not that complicated to build, but but, um, the real secret to them is there was a – this, this substance that was put inside of them that was called mana. And this mana is a superconductive substance. So when you put this mana inside the this arc, which is this capacitor, uh, it all it does is it builds up immense electricity, which is discharged. And uh, if you had several of these placed at key locations, Uh, they would basically just broadcast electricity uh, through the earth, through, uh, you know, electromagnetic lines of force on the earth, uh, much like what Nikola Tesla was trying to uh, do with his Wardenclyffe Tower. Now, um, I thought mana was stuff you ate. Yeah, you could eat it too. Yeah, it's uh, it's both. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a strange, it's a strange substance. it can be extracted out of uh, vegetable matter, as well as sea salt, um, as well as metals. Uh, but it's uh, it it can be eaten, and it and it seems to have health benefits in terms of being able to cure certain diseases, certain forms of cancer. Uh, but even beyond that, it, it also has this superconductive quality to it. And when it's put in these boxes, it just generates uh, tremendous electricity. So it had a twofold process and, and the, well, twofold uh, purpose, but the, the process for making it was an alchemical process. And you have to remember the, the arc was created to store the mana. And then the temple was created to store the ark. So, so ultimately, it was all going back to this mana. And uh, this mana was, was really the, uh, one of the secrets to uh, this technology. And, and I dare say, and, and this is going to get out there a little bit, but uh, you know, we find this same term mana being used all over the ancient world, usually in association with flying craft. Vimana? Like Vimana. Right. Uh, in the Indian texts, in uh, ancient Sumer, it's uh, the, the flying craft were referred to as Shimana. Right. In, uh, in uh, uh, Ethiopian texts like the Kebraganask, uh, King Solomon was said to have this flying carriage and he was manufacturing mana for it. Uh, but we also find it in things like uh, in Polynesian cultures, it's referred to as mana. Uh, in Tibetan traditions, it's referred to as mani. Uh, in some of the Albigensian Cathar traditions, it's referred to as mani as well. In fact, uh, if you ever if you ever see the, uh, there's a Tibetan prayer that goes om mani padmi hum it's uh it's a real common you'll see that if you go into any uh, import store that sells tibetan stuff you'll see it they always have a plaque or a flag or something with om mani padmi hum on it but but om was said to be the word of creation mani was said to be the the precious jewel or the precious stone uh, Padmi was the lotus and whom was the completion. So it was basically saying, you know, through, through the use of the word on this precious white material, this precious jewel, uh, it can open your chakras or your psychic centers and bring you to a, a full completion. This is basically what it's saying. Uh, but it, it goes right back to the same 
the same substance, exact same substance being used all over the world and described all over the world. Now, are all of these uh, 10 arcs, uh, you, uh, the Knights Templar have six, yep. same dimensions, are they identical? Yeah, they're all the same dimensions. They're, they're relatively identical. Um, and it, it perhaps more than coincidence, it's also worth pointing out that uh, the outer dimensions of these arcs are the same as the inner dimensions of the king's chamber, the sarcophagus and the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. Yeah, some call it sarcophagus. I call yeah. it a box. Yeah, that I'm box. Not, it's, it's a little small to be a sarcophagus. But so the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Ark would fit inside of that to do its to do its thing. Yeah, to broadcast the electricity around the area. Yeah. Right, right. And, Very- and some have speculated even that this was may have been why. Uh, Pharaoh was really chasing Moses because he stole one of the he stole one of the arcs out of Egypt. Yeah, and he needed it. Yeah. Now, um, uh, okay. So the R. Uh, I want to move on to some other things, but yeah. um, when can we see one? I want to see one. Does yeah. my pin? Does my pin get me? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the plan is we're, we're we're really we're really wanting to reveal this stuff now. I mean, it's part of why I agreed to be on your show is because we're we're starting to get people ready for this because uh, the world. I mean, one of the things that we absolutely believe as Templars is that all people have a spark of the divine in them. Uh, we call it the sacred flame, and it's within everybody. And uh, so no one group uh, is the chosen ones. We're, we're all the chosen ones. We just have to like lift ourselves up. And, uh, and so these, these treasures are really for the whole world. Um, we just have to make sure that uh, if we do start to reveal them, they're not going to be misused or misappropriated um and uh, that people understand what they are and that they're not meant to be some sort of you know secular badge for some some group to wear but rather uh as as something to celebrate as our collective humanity are would you consider them to be symbolic today um or could they still be used for something Oh, they could still be used for sure. Absolutely. Right. They, they could generate, uh, they absolutely could generate electricity around the planet. I mean, just throw some of this mana in there and, uh, you know, put them in the right places and they'll start to build up electricity and they'll broadcast it. You know, uh, a big reveal like this would, would, would change history. Uh, could the world handle this kind of uh, exposure? I, you know, it's 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 a funny thing. I, you know, Nikola Tesla tried to do a similar thing a hundred years ago, and uh, people weren't. It's it's debated whether people were ready for it or not. Uh, there's certainly the power structures of the day didn't want him to reveal it uh, because you start broadcasting free electricity to the world. I mean, how you, how do you make money off of that? Well, you know? see, we, there's the technical side of this, the technology side of this, but there is also, uh, like I said, there's a, a huge amount of symbolism here. Yeah, um, and and I, sure. man, I mean, I mean, and you could say even from a symbolic standpoint, uh, you know, even if even if there was no actual physical arc, even though there are six of them. Uh, the Temple of Solomon was built to be a giant human body in stone, much the same way that the Egyptian temples were, were built and the same way that the cathedrals were built. And so when the Ark was put in the Sanctum Sanctorum, uh, or the Holy of Holies of Solomon's Temple, the, the spot 
accordingly in in the human body would correspond to the brow or the or the forehead or the third eye and this is of course you know the ark was described as a communication device with god well you know symbolically you know you could say we have our own symbolic arcs within ourselves you know within our heads within our foreheads that's that acts as a communication device with god as well but uh but uh, beyond that there was an actual technology to this uh, the holy grail yeah all right now i was talking about monty python earlier and uh in, in a strange way that story made it out to the masses and and allowed us to do, do a deeper dive outside of the comedy but there um uh the story itself you know going back to parsifal and 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 some of the other uh stories uh in the past and the reference to the holy grail um and even in uh in, in monty python they 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 call it the the graal yeah and they, they spelled it uh a different way which i always found interesting okay so let's go to the holy grail yeah. What is the Holy Grail? We've got so many different modern versions of it uh, out there now. And, of, yeah. of course, Dan Brown and, and his version of it. And it's the bloodline of, of Christ. Uh, what is the Holy Grail? And do the Knights Templar have it? Yeah, so there were two. Well, there were basically three types of grail. I mean, one did absolutely represent this bloodline uh, from Jesus and Mary Magdalene, and also John the Baptist and Mary Magdalene, which is, uh, you know, going to be controversial to some, but, but at least, uh, you know, the, the, the text that we have suggests and the some of the artifacts that we've acquired uh, definitely suggests that Mary Magdalene was married uh, first to John the Baptist, and then when John died, uh, she was married to Jesus, and they had she had children with both of them. So this is the you know kind of the first thing that people are going to have to wrap, wrap their heads around. But then the second thing is you know the, the, really the only value of that bloodline was they were preserving a certain knowledge. And this knowledge goes back to the second aspect of the grail, which was this alchemical science, which was the science of creating this mana. In fact, if you look at the earliest Sumerian texts, uh, where it talks about this science that the Anunnaki gave to mankind, uh, it was referred to, to as Graal, G-R-A dot A-L. This is the earliest uh, use of this word that we ever find is Graal, and it alluded to the alchemical science, the science of alchemy. And it was believed that if you knew how to do this science, that you could uh generate the technologies not only for health and power, but also to um, literally get off this planet in the form of flight. And can, this- I, can I jump in for a second uh, before yep. we get to the break? I believe um, that in those Sumerian texts on those tablets, that they also refer to a process of powdering gold to disperse in their atmosphere to to block uh, the radiation. Yeah. And it was also a reference of powdering gold, and it just never made any sense to to a lot of us. But but it's also what you're describing here uh, uh, with the Knights Templar, mana, yep. and the operation of the Ark. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, even, uh, even in the story Parsifal, by Wolfram von Eschenbach, which was written in the 1200s. Uh, it, and Wolfram von Eschenbach was a Templar. Uh, he says that the guardians of the Grail are the Knights Templar. And one of the descriptions of the Grail is it says it is a stone that burns the phoenix to ashes, after which it comes back renewed. 
Well, this is a clear alchemical metaphor. I mean, it's alluding to the same process. And so this is in the 1200s uh, where, where this was being alluded to. So this is kind of the second grail aspect. The third grail aspect was philosophically the grail represented the meeting point between where uh, human consciousness uh, connects with the consciousness of the creator, whatever you want to call the creator. You want to call it God or Allah or Krishna or whatever, whatever you want to call it. The name doesn't matter so much. Um, El Ilian, uh, what, but it, but it did represent the place where our consciousness, our individual consciousness connected with the God consciousness, the, the, the creator consciousness, uh, or in other words, uh, within the Gnostic tradition, this was referred to as Gnosis or divine experiential knowledge, revelatory knowledge that anybody could attain. Uh, you didn't need a priest to do it, which was part of the reason why, uh, you know, the Roman church became so, uh, you know, uh, hard on the Gnostic groups because they were bad for business. Basically. Yeah, it was the real knowledge. Um, let me ask you this before the break. How did the uh, the chalice, uh, the, the Last Supper version of the Grail come into the mix? Misdirection? No, I mean, it, it, I mean ultimately, the, the Grail is a container. Uh, it's just a question of what kind of container is it. Uh, in one of the one of the the Grail legends, it even says that the Grail was an emerald that 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 there was a war in heaven and and uh, Michael, Archangel Michael, knocked this emerald out of the crown of Lucifer, mm -hmm. and this crown this emerald was brought to Earth by neutral angels and. Uh, and that uh, this became known as the Holy Grail, this this particular crown. And some say it was made into a cup. Others say it was made into a tablet. And of course, this is the origin of the quote unquote emerald tablet of Hermes, which is a, a tablet of alchemical instruction. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Timothy Hogan. Worldwide Grandmaster of the Knights Templar, here with us for the first time. I'm going to get all the secrets I can. <laughs> I am having a good time. This is Fade to Black. I am Rose Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Cartonel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. 
with wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) Hi, I'm Ray Sobs, and I'm here to tell you about something I really think you're going to like. The Unex Network is a part of a larger group called Unex Media, and one of the things we offer is the quarterly Unex Magazine, which is available both in print and digital formats. This amazing magazine covers all aspects of the unexplained, and makes for a great coffee table periodical that is certain to spark enlightening conversations in your living rooms. We invite you to check out the latest digital issue for free. Just go to unxnetwork.com forward slash membership and fill out your free membership with your name and email and become a new free member. The new summer issue is now available and the theme is Time Anomalies, which includes a feature article written by our managing editor, Lee Spiegel. Just go to unxnetwork.com Network.com forward slash memberships. That's unexnetwork.com forward slash memberships and get your free e copy of the Unex magazine today. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. I'm live. I had a hot mic the whole time. Did everybody hear me burning sage? I'm saging. I'm, I've got incense going. <laughs> I don't want to get in any trouble tonight. And uh, I'm wondering if everybody heard that going on in the background. I'm saging. I'm just I'm kidding. Uh, because I want to talk about the True Cross. There were so many missions and 
uh, everybody was on the hunt for the true cross. And um, as you know, Tim, over the years, there um, have been many stories, uh, a folklore, myth, legend about uh, pieces of the true cross brought into battle. Right. And and um, in every instance of that throughout history, those pieces of the cross have disappeared. Don't know if it was the, you know, what, what wasn't it Helen that, that was, you know, put a bounty on all of this stuff. And, and uh, now uh, did the Knights Templar uh, d- uh, get pieces of the true cross or the true cross itself? You know, I, I I'm skeptical of that claim to be totally honest. I mean, we, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that, that, uh, I mean, yes, there were things that were found that were disseminated to the different cathedrals that were being built, whether they were actually the true cross or not. Um, I, I don't know to be totally honest. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't, okay. I don't think so though. They, I've heard that if, uh, if they took all of the splinters that had been disseminated of all the pieces of the two true cross, uh, you know, that had been labeled in the world and you were to put them all together, that it would actually be uh, enough wood to build, you know, several houses. (laughs) I've heard the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard the same thing. Um, uh, spear of destiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so spear of destiny, uh, the, the Holy Lance, that was definitely one of the artifacts that was, uh, reclaimed. And, uh, you know, now there's, you know, anyone looking into history will, can find that, uh, that Lance, the Hapsburgs eventually got it and it wound up in the Hapsburg treasure house. And then Adolf Hitler got a hold of it at one point in time and uh and by some accounts uh a replica of it was put back in the the Habsburg treasure house and then uh the the original one was secured by the Americans and and now it's in a probably in a warehouse somewhere a private collection in in the United States I've heard the same thing that the one that is in Austria now right in the museum is is a replica yeah and the real one, um, I think these are pretty, pretty good accounts that the real one is here in the United States. Yeah, but not with the Knights Templar. But not with the Knights Templar. No, we don't. We don't have that uh, with us at this time. We have a lot of other really cool things. But like, never- like what? Like what? Well, so uh, I mentioned the arcs. Uh, accordingly, we also have. Uh, ossuaries with the bones of certain holy figures that we're hanging on to. Um, well, okay. Well, uh, you just can't get away with <laughs> without naming names. Ossuaries of whom? Uh, well, what we, they would be referred to as the holy families. So it would be, you know, John the Baptist, Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and their kids uh, that were all buried together in a tomb in East Jerusalem. Uh, the tomb was raided clear back in the 1200s. The bones were removed and uh, they were secured away and ultimately brought to the new world where they reside in one of our vaults to this day. Um, has there been any testing um, on you know DNA on, on these bones? We have not done any testing of DNA on them. No. Would but, you would you welcome testing? I yeah, mean, I, I, yeah, I think so. When the time's right, I mean, uh, I have no problem with that. Um, you know, the biggest hurdle. You know, I think one of the one of the biggest hurdles that we're trying to get over with all of this is that uh, we're not trying to invalidate anybody's beliefs. Uh, We're just trying to say that there might be a little bit more to the story than what people have been, you know, the pill they've been sold like, or whatever, however you want to put that. And that, um, you know, for a number of Christians, they, they believe that, 
you know, Jesus bodily raised from the dead and went to heaven. And to find bones of Jesus kind of contradicts that narrative, which is which could be a problem if you're just interpreting it literally, that he literally bodily went to heaven. Um, some of the texts that we've continued to pass down t- t- tend to suggest more along the lines of, uh, you know, heaven was a state of consciousness and, uh, and that to be born again literally meant to be born again. It was it was reincarnation, and uh, so there was reincarnation in the early doctrines of the of the church, which or within the Christianity, which um, you know is not being currently taught today. But it it doesn't. If you look at it from that perspective, it it doesn't. It shouldn't be a problem if there's bones of Jesus, because it doesn't mean he's he's gone. It doesn't mean he's dead. It just means he's you know went on to a new form. And so the ossuaries, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this. And for those that may not understand, in these tombs, the ossuaries um, were small stone boxes, and that that contained the bones of the person, the deceased. And they were stored uh, some on shelves, right? Uh, stone shelves, and and uh, uh, what's the words uh, that I want to use um, when you have an opening? And then you would uh, put the boxes there, seal the tomb. Yep. And and this went. Uh, this was part of the tradition in in uh, very early Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, and that this one tomb. Um, had the family of Jesus there and and others. So these stone boxes were removed and then brought here to the Americas? Yeah, ultimately, yeah. The, well, not all the boxes were removed, but definitely the contents of the boxes were removed and brought here to the Americas, yeah, where they reside to this day. Now, I envision, and we're going to continue, uh, but I envision like a press conference, right? What do you do? <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, so here's here's an ark. Here's an ossuary with Joseph and Jesus. Yeah. And and over here we've got a container of of mana that powered the ark. I, and is that is that how this is going to be done? I think that'll yes, that'll be that'll be kind of how it'll be. <laughs> um, and we'll have to set it up in such a way that uh, it's, you know, it's gonna, it's not gonna be controlled by any one government because you know, it's gonna be, uh, you know, you're gonna have uh, Italy's trying to claim it, you're gonna have Spanish trying to claim it, you're gonna have the United States government trying to claim it, you're gonna have Rome trying to claim it, uh, so. You know that's going to be a, and it really doesn't belong to any of them. It belongs to to everybody, and and so this is the, one of the hurdles that we gotta we gotta get over. Okay, so Friday the thirteenth goes down, and yeah. and the ship. Uh, there was knowledge of what was about to happen, and the orders that were uh, done uh, and instituted by Philip the Fair. And the ships are loaded up and and head out. Yep. Was it just to the Americas, or did they go to other countries as well? No, they went to other countries as well. I mean, initially they went uh, up to Portugal and to uh, Scotland, uh, you know, as I mentioned. Uh, but then they went to the Americas. They went across the way to the Americas. They had already been trading silver with the Mayans uh, for for you know a hundred years uh, prior to that so there there was and and they were already working with other tribes and and honestly this is really the reason why christopher columbus flew the templar cross on his ships when he went over to the new world is because he knew that they would uh they would recognize it uh to, you know Christopher Columbus himself was not a Templar, but he uh, he had uh, pulled 
one of the grand masters of the of the Knights Templar. His his daughter was in a convent, and he pulled her out of the convent, and married her, and was able to secure the 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 maps from her. Some of the maps from her. He went to Portugal and said, "Hey, fund me to go over to the New World. I, I know there's land across the way." And and basically, Portugal was like, "Well, you know." screw you, we already know that there's land over there because they were already protecting the Templars when they went underground. And so Christopher Columbus was like, well, fine, if you're not going to support me, then I'm going to go to your enemies. So that's how he went to Spain, who ended up funding him to, 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 go, to come to the, the quote-unquote new world that the Templars had already been exploring. And once you know this, it, it kind of explains why uh, the the Spanish and the Roman church went to such pains to try to uh, persecute the indigenous populations in the Americas because they were looking for these artifacts. They knew they had been brought over here. They just didn't know where they were. The, the documentation uh, that the Templars must have uh, done not only with the trips uh, that they made over here, but the inventory, the maps, the dates, this has to exist. Do the Knights Templar have uh, this documentation today? Yeah, we have uh, the ship logs of, of the trips over, and then the, there's a number of archaeological sites around the New World um, that... Uh, and, and markers that had been left by the order uh, back in time. Uh, you know, Scott Walter's done an incredible job trying to track these down. Uh, Got to put props out to him uh, sure. in his his research he's been doing with that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and and there are tribes that exist to this day who retain the memory of their association with uh templars in in times past and we continue to have those associations to this day have you seen uh, uh scott's stuff and he, he's hinging on every word by the way right he's like <laughs> go team um is, is is one thing but have have you seen the documentation as you know the grandmaster of the knights templar have you seen these documents and this is part of any press conference, right, that you're going to, somebody's going to ask, okay, well, where is the documentation to represent this? Have you seen the documentation that the Knights Templar is in possession of, and will this be shown uh, to the world? It will, yeah. All, all of this will be revealed. I mean, that's, that's the plan, is to just get all of this out with the hopes of bringing us together as a world community, uh, where we not in a not like in a one world new world order type of way in which you have some government trying to control everybody, but more uh, you know getting us it's, it's a reset back to you know recognizing the humanity in in all of us and we're all inheritors of this tradition. So how many? Um, okay. Again, I'm not being cavalier. This is like a serious question. Yeah. We all want a treasure map with X marks the spot, right? <laughs> we all, I want to do that someday. And somehow Scott Walter gets to do that every day, and I'm totally jealous. But we all want that. How many spots, location in, in North America are there where X marks the spot? Well, I mean, there's a number. I mean, at one point in time, there were uh, seven vaults, and uh, some of those vaults had been some of the um, some of the treasures, and some of those vaults were actually used to fund things like the American Revolutionary War. Uh, my my great grandfather, seven generations back, was General Joseph Warren, who was uh, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar back then, and he was the father of the American Revolutionary War. He initiated Paul Revere uh, to kind of give you an idea, and uh, and uh, there there was uh, some of this treasure was used to fund 
the Revolutionary War in order to try to create a free country where there was freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of religion and, and all these things that we take for granted uh, in which it was believed that uh, our rights came from God, not from the king, not from the church, but from God and uh, or the creator, whatever you want to call it. Um, in fact, you know, one of the earliest texts that mentions, in fact, the earliest text that mentions that uh, people have rights, you know, that does that comes from God is the story Parsifal. In fact, the story Parsifal says, if any Templar should become ruler of a foreign people, let him ensure that they are given their God-given rights. So this has always been a Templar theme. This has always been a Templar idea that, that people have God-given rights. And the United States was set up to be uh, a new Jerusalem where there could be um, safety to reveal these things and where everybody could be celebrated uh, regardless of their faith, regardless of their background. And uh, this is something that uh, even even way back, if we if we look at um, the former Templar commandery, for example, in Istanbul, or which was uh, used to be Constantinople, uh, there's a crypt there, and and in it there is buried Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Templars all buried together. Uh, so this was something that, I mean, you don't even see in most cemeteries today. They separate people based on religion. Right. But uh, with, as far as Templars were concerned, you know, we're all we're all uh, just uh, expressing, you know, the almost the the cultural trappings of the same truths. Now. You mentioned that uh, the, some of these artifacts here in the Americas at the seven vaults in these locations uh, were used to fund the Revolutionary War. That yeah. means they went into private hands. Mm -hmm. Do we have records of who they were sold to? Yeah, I mean, there were there were people like Benjamin Franklin that were involved in those transactions. Mm. Um James Madison uh, uh, and others, uh, you, you know, when you think of the, a lot of the founding fathers, they were, a number of them were involved in this same secret and the same mission and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And they were, they were trying to both preserve what had been inherited while also uh, trying to, uh, you know, having to use some of it in order to create a free state. Now, before we get to the break, when you describe uh, the seven locations as vaults, are they actual vaults that were constructed um, or, uh, you know, built, you know, a vault as, as we picture a vault, or are they it, natural locations, caves, if you will? No, they're, they are constructed vaults. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the vaults, one of the, the, uh, previous vaults that was used, uh, that's now empty in, uh, in Lebanon. And if, if you want to do some research, you can, you can find this, uh, there's a, there's a spot, there's a spot that's referred to as Hiram's tomb. Uh, and it's, everyone assumes it's this tomb for Hiram, King of Tyre, but it's, it's actually, not a tomb at all. It was a vault. And there's a, this location actually has a secret vault under it. That, and that's where things were stored for a while. I mean, they were eventually taken out of there, but there's still the vault underneath there. And here in the United States, uh, these seven locations, these vaults are constructed vaults. They're constructed vaults. Yes, that's correct. Um, are they in cities? Are they remote? Some of them are remote and some of them are 
yeah, in cities. <laughs> they're in they're in areas that people walk over all the time, not realizing it. And how many have you visited? Well, I've visited three of them. Well, I take that back. I've visited four of them personally. Right. And, um, and we and we have people that watch over them. Of, of course you do. Of yeah, course you do. So. Um, and the four that you have been to, I'm going to get the info out of you, Tim. <laughs> my job. Um, yeah, fair enough. Are we talking about New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago? Are we um, talking about major cities like that underneath a Freemason temple in, in, in Manhattan? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't quite, I don't, I don't want to quite get into that yet, but um, we'll be revealing it soon. It won't be long. So I was right. Washington, yeah. D.C., <laughs> Manhattan. Washington, D.C. is a fair bet. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> you think? Um, are we, uh, we're going to head to a break in a second. Um, and I know that I asked you this question over the weekend, so I'm going to ask it again. Um, a timetable? You know, are we talking about 2022 before the year's out, 2023? Uh, can you give me an idea of what we're talking about here? I've also asked Scott Walter these same questions, and I've been putting the pressure on him for years. Um, but once these dominoes start to fall, uh, you just got to go for it. You won't be able to stop. So, what yeah. kind of timetable? I mean, some of it's some of it's timing with what's happening in the world. I mean, originally we were looking at revealing some of this stuff clear back in 2019, and then uh, COVID happened, and uh, really, and the whole world started changing by you know 2020, and it just was not the right time or place for it. So, but it it, it won't be long. That's that's all I can say. I mean, we 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 still have to deal with the political realities of. Uh, certain power structures um, and uh, so but and we have to get people prepared for it as well and th again that's part of why I'm appearing on this show with you is is because we have to get people prepared for it because they're not uh, much like the uh, the whole UAP thing uh, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a shift in how people think about things Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Grandmaster of the Knights Templar Worldwide, Timothy Hogan, is with us. Going to take a quick break. We've got a lot more to get to, and we're going to do all of it right after this short break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black. 
you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, tonight. Timothy Hogan is with us, worldwide grandmaster of the Knights Templar. And uh, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of info that was dropped tonight, uh, Tim. And, and I know we've only scratched the surface. I want to get a, a few more important uh, points in, if I may. Because if we look at history, um, there are a lot of holes. A lot of gaps, and there's uh, a lot of misleading uh, teaching that is going on in our schools uh, around the world, and in history books, and 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 such. But if uh, if these things are revealed, you brought up uh, uh, mm-hmm. the Big A earlier. You said Atlantis. Yeah, I want to circle back to that point because. Uh, we are finding out more and more today, just through actual archaeology, that there were indeed uh, high-tech civilizations that had advanced knowledge, uh, you know, predating uh, Giza and ancient Sumer by uh, thousands and thousands of years. And this is part of the the of fact of historical record today. And of course, I'm directly referencing Gobekli Tepe and other sites uh, that now predate Giza. Um, But if some of this information is in possession of the Knights Templar and, you know, using a word like Atlantis that you can't speak in mainstream academia, you can't say that word. Um, This is going to upset quite a few people. When you say Atlantis, what are you trying to refer to with the knowledge that the Knights Templar is in possession of? Well, according, I mean, according to our tradition, I mean, Atlantis was a gl- global worldwide network at one point in time that, that completely crashed from cataclysm and that there were pockets uh, that survived that uh, that preserved certain information and we find this uh you know we find this this myth talked about in the americas with the nuado cultures like uh, the, the aztecs and the mayans they they referred to this previous civ- civilization that they called Atslan. uh well it's not too you know that was destroyed through cataclysm and and uh and you know it sunk beneath the waves. Uh, you know it's not too much of a stretch for, from to, from Atlan to be similar to Atlantis that that uh, Plato talked about. And uh, there are texts, for example, in Egypt at the Edfu building texts that also allude to this. Uh, this cataclysm that had occurred, you know, prior to the, the Zep Tepi, the time, the time before the Pharaohs ruled Egypt. Uh, it refers to this, this time when the gods, uh, were ruling this, this, uh, previous civilization and that, uh, 
and that there was a again there was some sort of a cataclysm and the knowledge was brought to egypt i mean i was just there in may with uh johnny enoch and and others taking a look at uh you know the edfu temple and and others that 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 tell this story uh we'll be going back there in march uh, for anyone who wants to go, but it's it's going to be um, it's right there on the temple walls, and it's in Egypt isn't the only tradition, like I said, who talks about this. I mean, the the, the Maya and and Aztec Nahuatl cultures refer to it. There's uh, there's Druid traditions that referred to it. Uh, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote the rule for the Templars originally, clear back in the 1100s. Uh, he was he was a renowned church cleric, but he was also secretly a practicing druid, and so he had inherited some of this information. Uh, and he was working with people like Rashi of Troyes, who was a very famous Kabbalist, uh, and uh, one of the texts that the Templars were said to have acquired, and this is through traditional Jewish sources, uh, was the the famous Kabbalistic text known as the Zohar. And uh, this Kabbalistic text of the Zohar also refers to uh, knowledge uh, about the earth that shouldn't have been known in that day. You know, it talks about there being seven continents and one of them's not populated and and uh, you know the the Earth rolls like a ball, and that uh, you know for some people it's daytime, other people it's night. Uh, it talks about all these things in this this text from the 1200s. You know that the the, the Templars gave to the Jewish communities in in Spain uh, in this Zohar text, but it was it was passing on this knowledge from this previous ancient civilization. And, Are you suggesting that? the world flipped right and where east was west and west was east and the sun is now rising on... uh, well the text doesn't say that but it does it just suggests it, it it talks about the planetary mechanics you know that that it rolls around like a ball um through space and that it goes around the sun and that uh and that there are all these continents that shouldn't have been known back in the 1200s. And yet here it is in this text. And it's clearly because there was information being passed down. There were also maps that had been found by the Templars uh, in, in their association with different groups. Uh, you know, there were, there were Celtic traditions that had been coming over to the new world. There were, Vikings that had come over to the New World. There were, by some accounts, there were even Greeks and Romans that had come over to the New World, as well as Egyptians. So and Sumerians. So there were there were, and Phoenicians. So there were all these people that had been coming over to the New World and they had records of of what was over here. And the Templars just collected all of this and you know were basically like, well, let's go. Let's go see if it's true. And and sure enough, they, they found their way to the new world long uh, before Columbus. Uh, what, where was Atlantis? Oh, okay. And, and before you answer, um, I'm actually preloading a conversation that we had over the weekend, but this is very interesting to me. Um, and, and to that end, um, are you uh, the Knights Templar today? in possession of maps that show where Atlantis was? Uh, you know, according to our, our traditions, again, Atlantis was more of a global network. I mean, it was parts of it were in North America. Parts of it were uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. Parts of it were in Antarctica. Uh and parts of it were in Europe. Uh, it was basically on all sides of the Atlantic. There was this this uh, civilization that was flourishing for a while, and, and then it collapsed. Now, that there are some 
who have suggested that even that that civilization was a a uh, a replica, if you will, of a of another civilization that was wasn't even on this planet. That that's a whole nother conversation. But uh, ex okay, uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, there there was a, there was a there was a belief that what was set up in the ancient world, uh, what we now call Atlantis, was simply a uh, a replica or a model of a previous, uh, an already existing civilization that was on another world. And that the beings from that world came down to this world, set up the civilization with all of its technology and everything else. Uh, and then it kind of got out of control. There was a natural disaster going to happen and they just kind of let it happen because they didn't think we were quite ready yet for for that level of technology. And now we're at a point kind of where we were at before. So uh, one of the Templar missions, we, we believe to this day, aside from getting these artifacts out, is to also uh, kind of prepare people to, to bring people together. It's the hope that these artifacts will bring people together uh, so that we can move on to our greater destiny beyond this world. And the, the continent itself, um, and I find this very interesting um, uh, about the, the possibility of something, uh, you know, outside of our star system uh, arriving here. Um, there's a lot of texts that support that idea. Uh, yeah. and we can talk about Sitchin. Uh, you know, bringing this up, but Atlantis itself as a continent, as a capital, as a continent, was that in the middle of the Atlantic? Mm, uh, our sources say it was actually in the new world in in, uh, in what's now the United States area of the United States. And in fact, this is really the reason why later on, uh, one of the Templars of our tradition was Sir Francis Bacon, and you may or may not know, but he wrote a book called The New Atlantis, and he was describing this civilization that knew the entire world, but nobody knew of its existence, and uh, and he and that they had all of these different technologies and everything else. And he was actually alluding to, uh, he was creating, it was a metaphor for plans to set up the new Atlantis back in the new world, to set up the United States um, in the same area where Atlantis had been previously. So what do we do with um, the Edfu building text, uh, you know, Plato's uh, description of Atlantis, um, it being a ringed island that it blew up and, and fell into the ocean. Are you saying that that's not the case that uh, North America itself was Atlantis? Well, there were, there was definitely parts that sunk into the ocean, but uh, yeah, North America itself had uh, said civilizations here that, um, you know, and I think that eventually the archaeology will, will prove this to be the case. I mean, right now we're focusing on places like Gobleki Tepe and others, but uh, that support, you know, advanced ancient civilizations, you know, more in the area of Turkey. But, um, but I think that, uh, well, I'm quite certain that eventually it's going to be revealed that uh all of that and more was here in the new world. What do we do with, uh, I think this is one of the most important, quite, that, that statement, everything that we just said is, you know, that those ripples are going to go out uh, uh, into the community over the next couple of weeks. That, you know, uh, uh, America being, being Atlantis. Uh, so uh, let's, let's let that simmer. Let's put that on the back burner uh, for a minute. But with so many uh, uh, different transoceanic cultures, uh, and the Knights Templar uh, being one of the main ones coming to North America, 
How does that change things about who we are? And is there a possibility of a Portugal or a Spain or Sweden, for that matter, uh, to, to have a land claim on the United States? You know, I think uh, some of the early founding fathers were actually worried about that. Uh, in the Roman ch church in Spain was worried about that. In fact, when they came over here and they found uh, blue-eyed Indians that were speaking an early form of Welsh, they, they proceeded to eradicate them as, as quickly as they could because they didn't want to, you know, they were worried that they could uh, have more of a claim on, on the territory than, than they could. So uh, history is full of that, sadly. Um, but ultimately, you know, you have to remember pretty much everybody on planet Earth today uh, is related to the same group of people going back only 12,000 years. Right. Humanity has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. So, you know, to for us to start getting wrapped up about something that happened 10,000 years ago in terms of who we are now, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little silly. I mean, I, I look at like these 23andMe genetic testing, for example, they tell you who your relatives were, you know, maybe a few hundred years ago. Well, you know, your relatives came from other relatives that moved around a lot, you know, from going back thousands of years. And uh, and and who who we really are, uh, you know, really transcends all that. Well, OK, so to that end, um, and it's kind of circling back to where we were uh, earlier, the. When you read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and certainly the Da Vinci Code, which is, you know, a pop culture thing, but there are, there are ideas there that have been pretty strong uh, for a very long time. Dan Brown didn't just discover all of this. Yeah. But to have uh, the migration of Jesus and Mary uh, on boats arriving in the south of France and and moving into uh, Southern Europe and establishing uh, the bloodline and continuing through uh, France and through Europe, uh, is this part of uh, the knowledge base of the Knights Templar? Or is that just pop culture folklore? No, there is something to that. Uh, but again, the value of that bloodline is not as much the bloodline as, as it is the, the knowledge that was being passed down by that bloodline. They were preserving uh, ideas and, in, in, you know, certain ideas and knowledge that were contrary to the power structures of the day. And uh, that they continue to preserve that knowledge. I mean, for example, in my own case, my my I mentioned my great grandfather, uh, uh, General Joseph Warren, from seven generations back. He was, um, you know, he was an alchemist prior to being a prior to being a revolutionary. He, he was a physician and he was an alchemist. In fact, that's why he was even studying with Paul Revere, who was a silversmith because uh, they were studying alchemy together and they were they were they were preserving this knowledge that had been passed down uh and when i first started looking into some of this stuff i i went to my grandfather hugh warren who was a metallurgist at denver university so and he's the one who taught started teaching me alchemy so that's an example of this knowledge being passed down within family lines. And that's where the value of the bloodline is. I mean, it has less to do. It's not like the blood has some special magical properties to it. It, it has to do with the knowledge that's being passed down through that, through that line, those lines. The um, uh, the other part to this, if if all of this is true, um, where you have billions of Christians and, and Catholics on this planet, uh, a huge control 
Um, and uh, uh, there would be a power vacuum, I would, I would suggest, that if this is established as fact, then uh, for three and a half billion people on this planet, they've been living or taught a lie. Well, they've been taught a uh, half truth. There's, uh, there's, yes. there's a great, there's a great quote by Louis Claude de Saint-Martin, who was a French philosopher in the 1700s, and he said, uh, "The great misfortune of man is not that he's unaware of truth, but that he misconstrues its nature." And that's what we're talking about. Like people are aware of a story, they're aware of a um a tradition they're just might be interpreting it wrong it, that's <laughs> and uh I'm, I'm so glad i burned the sage uh because <laughs> because if i'm wrong but uh if you're wrong uh but here's the thing though if if this is indeed the case, and we are sitting on um, alchemical traditions that go back thousands of years yeah. um, uh, to uh, support the technology behind the Ark and the creation of mana and the alchemical traditions that went through Egypt, and I, I said it earlier, um, into Greece, where you have not only philosophy and, and the hard sciences that were coming in, but the alchemical traditions that were the third prong in all of this. Because if you go back to Isaac Newton and 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 the, the great scientists back, they, they looked at three different things. And, and you can even add religion as a fourth. But all of this was eliminated and lost um, and, 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 and were uh, stored with the Knights Templar. Right. Yeah. This is this is something that would truly rewrite history, Tim. Yeah. And it and it, you know, it's, it, we also have to look at realize that uh, much of the Bible is written in terms of metaphor. It was a, it was an initiation document. I mean, let me give you an example uh, about related to alchemy in the New Testament. So this superconductive substance that that I was talking about that was put in the ark. Uh, it was also in 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 uh, biblical text. It was referred to as mana. It was also referred to as bread. It was also referred to as salt. It was also referred to as white stone. Uh, and these were it was referred to as shrew bread. You know, it was referred to all of these different things. And so, and and part of the reason why it was referred to as salt, for example, is because you could actually extract it out of salt or out of seawater. So in the story of Jesus, we have Jesus born from Mary, uh, Maria. Maria in Greek actually means salt water or sea. So what happens when you heat salt water? Well, salt cubes miraculously get born from it, right? I mean, it's literally like a, a divine birth, right? Because because you get these salt cubes that, that get these salt cubes that, that come out of the salt water, just like Jesus being born from Mary. And where is Jesus born? He's born in Bethlehem. Well, what does Bethlehem mean? It means house of bread. It comes from Beth which means house and lechem, which means bread. So you, so you have Jesus being born from Mary in Bethlehem, and uh, this is it's it's a it's literally alluding to the this whole alchemical process of how to extract this mana from the salt itself. Um, the same. Uh, these same allusions are, are found in uh, the story of Moses witnessing God as a burning bush. Well, the other place that you can extract this mana is out of the ashes of burnt down vegetable matter. So, um, you know, so it makes sense that God was a burning bush if, if you were trying to do that alchemical operation. So it's, it's all there in the Bible and, and, you know, I could give you a hundred other examples of it, but the point is that the Bible was written with these metaphors, these alchemical ideas 
uh, in it. And the discoveries that the Templars found just substantiated uh, these ideas, which before, are not how they're normally taught. Uh, uh, before we go to the break uh, and come back, we just have uh, uh, 20 minutes left, and I've got a, a, a bunch of stuff I want to get in. Um, and I want to talk about where the Knights Templar are today and and the traditions of of today and how they relate to the past. And I want to get to all of that. Uh, but before I do, the knowledge of of mana and and uh, the ability to create this um, and, as the power source for the Ark, where did that knowledge come from? Are you suggesting that came from Atlantis? Yeah, that that would be my suggestion. Yeah, C- originally came from Atlantis. It uh, was reposited in uh, Egypt and other places after the Atlantis sank after it, after the Great Cataclysm. Uh, it was preserved for a time in places like Egypt, and uh, yeah, and 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 in Jerusalem and and uh, you know in some other areas and. Uh, the Templars just found all this and the Egyptians had it um, outlined on their temple walls. So, you know, when the Templars went down to Philae, for example, where they set up their commandery at the temple of Isis and Philae, mm-hmm. they, uh, you know, they started finding these things and were like, Oh, okay. This is how the Ark works. This is what the, the mana bread is. We can clearly see it being fed here to the Pharaoh. Uh, in fact, anytime you see the Ark depicted on these Egyptian temple walls, you usually see these these cone-shaped uh, cakes, these bread cakes. That in are, their hands, uh, right? In their hands, yeah, yeah exactly. Yep, and so this is the mana, you know, but they're always shown together, and it's because they go together. Akhenaten just winked at me. I'm just going to let you know I'm watch that in the replay. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and get into overtime and wrap this up. And one of the things I'm going to ask him about, I wanted to say this for overtime, is the tablets, the Ten Commandments. Where are they? Tim, don't say anything. Don't say anything. We're going to do that when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black, our guest tonight, Tim Hogan, Worldwide Grandmaster of the Knights Templar. What a great conversation. We'll be right back for more right after this short break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. 
This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db vx are you ready to read about true paranormal events unx media publishes non-fiction books about ufos ghosts and haunted places time anomalies cryptid creatures and more just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie K. That's unxmedia.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. <laughs> It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. An amazing conversation tonight. We're not quite done. Timmy the Ogan, worldwide grandmaster of the Knights Templar, is here with us tonight. And uh, just let me say uh, thank you, Tim, on behalf of the community um, uh, coming in tonight uh, uh, with you you letting me know in advance. Don't hold back, Church. Just Just let's go. Yep. And um, and and I feel like I've, I've I've got fifty questions that I didn't get to, and and we will do future shows. Let's do you know a, a show on alchemy. Let's do a you know a show on on artifacts. We'll sure. we'll say uh, I also want to focus on traditions. Yep. And uh, now I've got a couple of things that uh, I held back uh, for overtime, and, and overtime I like to loosen up a little bit. Uh, these are very serious subjects tonight, uh, but. I like to loosen up a little bit when we do get to overtime. Um, and, but I do want to talk about the 10 commandments mm-hmm. um, and, and where are they? Are you in possession of them? The, the tablets that were allegedly, well, I shouldn't say that I burn the incense. I think I'm in the clear <laughs> um, uh, placed in the ark. Yeah. Uh, uh, what can you tell me about that? And uh, where are they? Well, so if, you go back and read your Bible. It talks about how uh, Moses, when he came down from the uh, from the mountain, he had 
uh, a, an initial set of tablets known as the Tablet of Testimony. And he decided that they weren't ready for this yet. So he broke it and he didn't give it to the to them. But then he also had another set of tablets which uh, were had the, the commandments on them. And he did give that to the people. Um, according to our records, there are some different tablets uh, that are in the vaults. Uh, one is... Uh, could be associated with the Ten Commandments. It's written in Phoenician. And uh, it seems to be the, the Ten Commandments. The other tablet, which is referred to as the Tablet of Testimony, uh, is actually uh, the uh, what we believe is the Emerald Tablet, which came to be known as the Emerald Tablet of Hermes. And that this tablet, this other tablet, the Tablet of Testimony, um, part of the reason why it was broken uh, was because it was made of a substance that looks like emeralds, but it's not actually emeralds. And when you, it's it's actually like a copper acetate. And when you, if you break it down and you heat it, you can actually extract uh, this mana essence out of it. So it was, so it was, it was actually all part of that, all that alchemical process. But there's a possibility that the Ten Commandments, that stone, are in a vault and in the possession of the Knights Templar. Yeah, at least it's something that looks like them. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're the original ones or not, but uh, Phoenician, and that, that's interesting. Phoenician. Yeah. Who can read Phoenician today, Scott Walter? <laughs> Probably I can, but it's I can. you know it's it's uh, I mean basically the when the Bible refers to the Canaanites, the Canaanites were actually the Phoenicians, and uh, and you can actually see an evolution. And this is kind of getting a little off topic, but I, it's something I geek out on. If if you look at Egyptian hieroglyphs you can see how the Egyptian hieroglyphs, the letters for the Egyptian hieroglyphs evolved into the Phoenician language. And from the Phoenician. Oh, we just lost Timothy. <sighs> the Vatican stepped in. Timothy, are you still there? Oh, uh, uh, uh. see, I see. I don't even know. If uh, Timothy can hear me. Oh, uh, okay. You're back. You're back. See, yeah. I don't know what happened there. We got kicked off for a second. Yeah, yeah, the Pope stepped in. Enough is enough. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Enough is enough. Um, so, uh, uh, okay. So the Phoenician language, the Canaanites, that's where yeah. you got cut off. Yeah. So, so that, and then the, so that you can see how that Phoenician language then evolved into Hebrew. So you can see how it went from Egyptian hieroglyph to Phoenician characters to Hebrew. I mean, you can clearly see that progression. And uh, if I, I would encourage anyone who's, who's interested in looking more into the Phoenicians uh, and particularly the connection between the Phoenician stuff and Jesus to check out the book, uh, Jesus, the Phoenician by Kareem al who's a, who's a, you know, a dear friend of mine who wrote the foreword, uh, for, uh, one of his books. And, uh, anyhow, he has, he has really good stuff. Okay. The hooked X. Yeah. Okay. Scott Walter just leaned forward. <laughs> Um, the hooked X Templar. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely a symbol that we use the hooked X for sure. In fact, I, I use it in my signature to this day, uh, as grandmaster. That's one of the things I, I have in my signature that I use. Uh, did you do that before you met Scott? I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, if I today, uh, what, what would it take for me, uh, to join the Knights Templar? So, uh, you know, there are several different 
Templar lineages out there. So when the Templars were suppressed in 1307, they had to go underground. And uh, some of them went to Scotland and uh, became uh, really the Order of the Thistle and the Royal Order of Scotland, uh, and the Order of St. Andrews up in Scotland under Robert the Bruce. Uh, some of them went to Portugal and just renamed themselves the Knights of Christ and existed that way. Some of them went to um, became stonemasons because they had already built, you know, a thousand different Gothic structures and all these cathedrals during their, uh, you know, the 200 years between, uh, you know, 1118 and, and uh, 1307. So they just became stonemason guilds, which eventually developed into Freemasonry. Uh, so Freemasonry became this. Uh, some of them became went to Germany and, and formed a group known as the Militia Crucifera Evangelica, which eventually became the Rosicrucian movement out of Germany. Um, and then there were others that just kept calling themselves Templar uh, and just went to places like, uh, you know, in the Middle East where they could, they could continue to exist or they became a, uh, you know, an admiralty uh, naval fleet and just lived on the seas. They created their own nation. I mean, they really became the first pirates uh, attacking back at the countries that had attacked them. So, so there were all these different lineages of Templarism that survived. Uh, eventually, with time, they, they began to start to work together again and do different things together again. And so now what we do, for anyone who's interested in uh, pursuing this path, they could certainly go to any one of these different traditions. I mean, they could go become a Freemason or a, or a Rosicrucian or or, you know, any, any of these other bodies. Um, one of the ways uh, to move forward is we also set up a school known as the Templar Collegia, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of like a pre-study body where anyone who joins it is given all the materials that we feel is necessary to get people kind of caught up before they're, they're actually knighted. And, uh, you know, so we take them through a series of initiations and we give them study materials and, uh, over the space of a couple of years, if they stick with it, then, uh, eventually we'll knight them as a Templar and, uh, they can start to participate in the work that we're doing. Are there, um, are there levels? You know, we always, you know, third degree Mason, you know, and I became a third degree Mason. That was the toughest part for me to go through. And I got to that. And then I had different uh, avenues in front of me uh, that I could choose. And one of them is the Knights Templar. Am, am I correct in stating it that way? Yeah, sure. Yeah. There's uh, like in Freemasonry, there's the York Rite or the Scottish Rite. Or if you live in, Ger you know, many Germanic speaking countries, uh, there's also the Swedish Rite, uh, but all of these are higher degrees of Freemasonry, and in all of them, they all culminate uh, to a Templar degree. Uh, in, in the York Rite, it, it culminates to a Knight Templar degree. In the Scottish Rite, it culminates into what's known as a Knight Kadosh degree, which is just means Holy Knight, which is a Knight Templar. <laughs> Uh, in the Swedish Rite, they, they pretty much tell you right from the beginning you're joining a Templar organization. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, there, there are levels. Uh, and with each level or each degree, you're given more of the story. And you're given more things to study, more uh, philosophical ideas. Uh, and uh, some of these orders are co-ed. You can see the question here. Can yeah. a woman, can women, can, can women, I think, uh, can, women, can women be knights? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, traditionally, historically, there were women Templars. 
fact, even Hugh de Paines, who was the first Grand Master of the Knights Templar, his wife was Catherine de St. Clair, and she was also a Templar. Uh, and she was the cousin of Chrétien de Troyes, who was uh, wrote one of the first Grail legends, uh, you know, on uh, the legends of the Holy Grail. And and uh, but there were there were women preceptors. Uh, there were, you know, they weren't just in the kitchen. They were they were actually participating with all of the activities, and that continues to this day. I mean. Uh, Certainly, if, if you were to join the Templar Collegia, uh, there are men and women who are involved in it. Uh, same with uh, other e expressions of it, like you know, different Rosicrucian and Martinist and, and unknown philosopher lineages. They, they allow women in it. Uh, there are, there are co-Masonic bodies, and there are also women-only Freemasonry. So absolutely, women could be involved in it. Uh, at what point, this is what everybody wants to know. At what point do I get into the back room? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, pr pretty, pretty soon. I mean. It, no, I mean, if I become a Knights Templar. Right? Yeah. When, when does Tim go, okay, church now. You want to see some cool stuff? Oh, pretty much right away. Uh, I mean, right away, you'll start studying stuff that'll blow your mind away. Uh, and then, you know, we there. It's all designed to be practical, so that uh, like if we we if we talk about alchemy, we're not just talking about alchemical theory. We're actually teaching you how to perform alchemical operations. Um, same with the. Uh, you know, a number of, a number of things in the curriculum. So, and, well, and oh, go ahead. eventually, eventually you learn about where some of these vaults are and we do have a responsibility still to protect them. I mean, if, if God forbid, uh, you know, the wrong people were like something like uh, Al Qaeda or something were to, were to try to, <laughs> try to raid one of these vaults or the Vatican, which the Vatican is, is absolutely tried to raid some of these vaults. In fact, even recently the, the Vatican tried to raid one of the vaults. Um, we have to go in and uh, deal with it. Um, and, and some of that may be mean moving some of the artifacts to a new location. Uh, what was the, I want to go back to Dan Brown. Who was the dude that was white? What was the name of the organization that he represented with the Vatican? Oh, he was he was with um, he was with. Uh, I, I'm drawing a blank. How, how, how do we forget that so quick? Yeah, yeah. Popular story on planet Earth for five years. Yeah, uh, um, I, I, keep, I keep wanting to say Agnes Day, but it's oh, Agnes oh, Day means. Opus the Lamb Day. of God, yeah. Opus Day. It was Opus, Opus Day. Day. Opus yeah, Day. Opus Day. Yeah, you were close. You were close. Yeah, yeah. Opus Day. Um, that that has to be a concern, right? It, it is. It absolutely is. In fact, uh, I, I can tell you right now, uh, only a few years ago, there, there is a vault that still exists in Istanbul, and uh, we have Templars who are uh, with in charge of the um, you know the monuments there in in Istanbul, and they work for the 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 Turkish government, and uh, they ended up hearing uh, jackhammers basically coming from under the street level, and they knew somebody was trying to break into these vaults, and sure enough, they discovered uh, that the Vatican had dug a tunnel from one of the hotels nearby. They'd found where the this vault was and had where there's uh, certain artifacts and they had were trying to break into the vault. And fortunately, the stone that the vault con containing the stalt, the 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 artifacts was a really hard stone that's referred to as Zeus stone because it's so hard to break into and. So they weren't able to they weren't able to break through to it, but uh, you know this type of thing still happens to this day. And in fact, I, I would even 
suggest, um, and this is somewhat speculation on my part, but I think it's a safe speculation. Uh, when you saw that fire at Notre Dame Cathedral and you saw those fires at all of those cathedrals in France around that same time at mm -hmm. other cathedrals. And uh, coincidentally, the same day that the Notre Dame of Paris caught on fire, the former Templar commandery in Jerusalem also caught on fire. Um, it it looks to me like it was probably the Roman church setting these things on fire so that they could um, dig around in these monuments. They could close them to the public and start uh, digging around in them because, you know, they thought that there might be vaults contained within these cathedrals, even though anything that was in these cathedrals had already been moved. Right, right, right. Um, a, a couple of last qu uh, quick questions. Uh, you put the number at 10 of the original arcs. Yeah. Six are in uh, the Knights Templar possession. Yeah. What are the other four? Um, there are two. Well, there are three that we think we know where they are. Uh, one may be in Ethiopia. One may be buried under this lake. And one of them may still be in Egypt on a on an island in Egypt. Um, so that's the other. Those are three other ones, but uh, but we don't know where the the last one is. Very interesting. Um, and uh, today, uh, with the establishment of the Knights Templar and the organization that is there. Um, how does somebody uh, reach out directly, uh, A, to uh, the Knights Templar, but B, if they are interested in finding out more, what's the best spot? Oh, they could go to www.templarcollegia.org and uh, they can send a, you know, the, the, if they go there, they'll, there'll be an email that they can uh, send, you know, to, to request more information. And the, the grand secretary will get back to them. And then, you know, if they want to start that path, we can make it happen for them. Do you feel that uh, in speaking out uh, and, and sharing this information, do, do you feel threatened? There have been times, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll admit, I mean, I've been, uh, I've encountered some pretty rough times uh in the past uh it, you know, i've been shot at i've been stabbed and i've been poisoned at different times in the past uh uh and in fact uh not too long ago i i was even attacked i was at the area of Baalbek in in lebanon and uh uh we were we were attacked there so um yeah i mean there have been times where it's uh, it, it it can be challenging for sure. There 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 are all kinds of groups that that don't want this information out. Well, I appreciate this conversation tonight, Tim. It was great, and um, uh, I'm just gonna let everybody know we were able to break bread and 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 hang out and and have a an amazing uh, dinner. Uh, over this weekend and wow i mean we had a lot of we had a lot of powerful minds at that table didn't we and yeah, sure did. conversation uh that went around but uh, everybody just wanted to talk to you and, and we're talking about some pretty strong people <laughs> at that table and 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 i gotta say that uh you 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 were and have been uh very open about these subjects that uh just don't just haven't been openly discussed in the past. And I, I really want to thank you tonight. And it was just an amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you so much. And I can't wait for the next one. Well, thank you. I can't wait for it too. It's, it'll, be, it'll be the Tim and Jimmy show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Tim. I want yeah. you to be safe out there. Keep rolling that rock uphill. Uh, the world is in a very strange place right now. We all know that. And we do need to be brought together. And just thank you for that. Yeah, thank you.
Tim, behave and be well. You too. Thank you so much for having me. You're the best. Timothy Hogan. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, what a great week uh, so far on on Fade to Black. And, and I want to thank Tim Hogan uh, for taking the time tonight to – uh, to be very uh, open and free with his knowledge. There's so much more uh, to get to, and we will do it in future shows. I promise you that. And uh, tomorrow night, uh, Rick Doty is going to be here. Rick is is also going to be talking about some pretty sensitive subjects, which is misinformation and disinformation that may be going on right now in our UFO community and ufology in general. Great week on Fade to Black. Thursday night's going to be another Fader night with open lines all night long. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm. Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitola, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Rick Doty, I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.